someone is asked to come in and give a TED talk or a TED presentation, it's because they've done something extraordinary or remarkable in their life. Um, the only thing I've done lately is quit my job, which has subsequently ruined my credit. That being said, my wife and I have um, left our teaching careers, and we've taken most of what we own and put it on our backs. And we are in search of a skill set that includes learning how to grow food, um, secure water, build shelter, and if we're fortunate enough, find a community that will put up with us. Um, some people think that's extraordinary. Most people think it's frightening. I think it's an example of inherent privilege and a result of inherent privilege. I want to start by addressing the young people in the audience because you are the ones who will inherit this culture after old people like me and die leave. And I want you to value this time in your life because this is the time we can still make your choices. And it goes by really quick. I mean, as you know, when you're a teenager, you think you can do anything, and you generally do. Your 20s will be a blur. Your 30 as well, you'll get a hot dog, maybe. But um, you'll raise a family, um, you may have some kids, and you'll wonder what the hell happened to my 20s. Your 40s, you'll grow another chin. The music will start to get a little too loud. And one of your girlfriends or boyfriends from high school will become a grandparent. In your 50s, you may have um, a minor surgery. You'll call this a procedure, but it's a surgery. And in your 60s, you'll have a major surgery. Um, and the music will still be too loud, but it won't matter at that point because you won't be able to hear it. In your 70s, you and your significant other will move to, like, say, uh, I don't know, Florida, where you'll spend your days having dinner at 2 in the afternoon, lunch at 10 in the morning, and breakfast at 9 before. Um, you'll spend most of your time wandering around the malls searching for the ultimate soft yogurt and mumbling to yourself, how come the kids don't come? In your 80s, you'll have a major stroke and you'll end up battling to some nurse who feeds you jello and you call mom. Now, I tell that monologue, to repeat that monologue from Billy Crystal in the movie City Slippers, mainly for several reasons. One, most of us are city slippers. We no longer go out and get our own food, secure our own water, build our own shelter. These things are done for us now. The other reason is because it seems like a typical, although humorous, slice of life for our culture. But it's only typical if you belong to this culture, which is built upon and maintained by inherent privilege. If you're outside of this culture, that slice of life is anything but typical. What's typical to us is Tea Party protests, occupiers on occupied land, double dip recession, stock portfolios, Facebook, Netflix, plastic floating in our oceans that create islands the size of two states of Texas, Gulf spills or oil spills in the Gulf, iTunes, iPods, iPads, iPhones, and of course, the all-important boredom. We have created the concept of boredom. I was in Africa, and specifically in Uganda, about a year and a half ago, and I was with about 30 people, and we were touring a school, and the children there were putting on presentations. They were uh, dancing and singing, and they did some poetry. And there was a line in a poem that hit me like a punch in the stomach. They said, thank you, white people, for taking away our boredom. That's when it hit me that I live in a culture that packages, promotes, and sells boredom. And it does it no, back to that, through what I've just talked about. And these are also the results of boredom. And so I started to wonder, what is my place in all this? I mean, did I have a choice being born in this culture? Does that really matter? I mean, I live in a culture where Billy Joel claims we didn't start the fire and REM says it's the end of the world as we know it, and Matchbox 20 wants to see just how far we've come. I wanted to know just how far I had come. And what I discovered is, I don't know how to do anything besides talk. I surely don't know how to find food besides going to, you know, fries. 
secure water, or build durable shelter. And so it started to bother me. And I really wanted to figure out who I was. So I did a lot of reading, a lot of soul searching, and I had to start with me. And so who am I? Well, I'm a white heterosexual male born to middle class, Christian, educated parents. I myself am college educated, I am able bodied, and I was born in the United States. And the United States part is key here because geography means everything. If you've ever read Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, he points out how geography has influenced human societies and how some human societies have come to dominate other societies. Well, if I look at my own situation, being born into the most powerful, wealthy country the world has ever known, and then on top of it, I'm a white, straight male. I had to go back and see, well, why does being born in the United States give such weight to those social categories? And so I started to think about, well, how did the United States become so powerful? And I had to look at, well, acquired the land through the genocide, displacement, and rounding up of the native people. It gained its wealth through the exploitation of immigrant workers and the kidnapping, enslavement, displacement, and murder of countless numbers of people from Africa. And so what it has done is it's given birth to a culture where I don't have to think about consequences. Because being a white straight male, I surely don't have to think about racism or white supremacy. I don't have to think about patriarchy. I don't have to think about things like homophobia or heterosexism, unless I really want to. And as soon as it becomes uncomfortable, I can just stop thinking about it. But if you're outside of my group, or my groups, you not only have to think about it, you have to live it. It's called oppression. And so usually this is the part in the presentation where some people get a little uncomfortable, or a little angry, or might feel like I'm trying to guilt them into something. As my good friend Calvin Terrell says, you didn't have a choice whether you were born into privilege or oppression. But the question is, do you have a responsibility for the life you lead? And if so, what is that responsibility? And if not, why not? So that's the question I've been asking myself. And hopefully that's the question you take outside these walls and start to ponder in your own lives. So what, it, what has happened is the inherent privilege that I belong to is created a culture where I don't have to think about circumstances and consequences. Consequences go to those who are outside of the inherent privilege. And so the culture we belong to is industrial civilization. And there's a basic definition up here about what civilization is, but the important part is the dependency on fossil fuels. I had a career. I don't have time to go find food and secure water and build something to live in. I have vacation. I have money to spend. Other species live. I tend to use the planet. And if I'm using the planet, am I really living at all? That's the question I started to ask myself. And so the privilege that I have for living in industrial civilization is the hidden relationships. And if I just take this computer that I created this presentation on and look at the hidden relationships, I can see that the materials for the computer were extracted by underpaid miners in what we call in our culture the developing world. And then the computer chips were worked on by poor women in places like Vietnam and China. And those chips, by the way, give cancer. And then it was shipped either by plane or by boat and then eventually by a truck which uses fossil fuels, which creates carbon. And then if I just break down one of those things, like the truck, and all the things that go into making the truck, and the people that might be exploited from building this truck, and the ecosystems that are affected by this truck, and the species that are wiped out because we're building these trucks. Well, that's something I don't think about when I go to Best Buy to buy my computer. And then I buy the computer, usually from somebody who is underpaid in our society because we have to make a profit selling this computer. And then I use the computer for a certain amount of time, and then I get rid of it. And it probably goes someplace, I have no idea where it goes. It probably goes maybe to a landfill. But not near my neighborhood. Probably where people are poor, and then it affects and poisons their drinking water. That's just a computer. Think about our daily lives of all the food 
the electricity we use, the things we take for granted from the moment we wake up and hit the light switch until everything in between, until we hit the sack at night and hit the light switch again. And so this is what I've been dealing with for the last few years in my head. And then what generally happens is once I start to get used to these things, well, I feel entitled to them. And this is what entitlement looks like in my culture. Everything from Kiwi in December, or whenever I want it, to Big Macs and water coming out of the taps, you name it. This is what it sounds like. Walmart's cheap, turn the lights on. And then I still, I still whine about it, the internet's too slow. You can see C.K. Lewis, he talks, everything's amazing, but nobody's happy. We complain about delayed flights. Can you imagine taking a walk in? And so, I usually meet a little bit of resistance on that. I've had people in the past go, well, Mike, that's great, but, you know, I earn money, and I pay for these things. You know, I pay for my water bill. That's not entitlement. I've earned it. Well, my question back to you is, do all parties agree to your social contract within your culture? Did the ecosystems that your goods and services are destroying agree? Did the 200 species that are being wiped off the planet daily, did they agree? Did the people in lower paying jobs that are being exploited to get these services to you, did they agree? Because you've worked hard, you somehow earn these things? And so, I have privilege, I feel entitled to it, and what it tends to do is it distorts my boundaries. It turns my perspective into truth. Because now, I just think, well, this is just the way it happens. This is the way people live. This is the truth. This is how it works. This is how it goes. And I start expecting others to live that way. I expect other people that have perspectives because I have the truth. If you're not... If you're outside of my group, you have a perspective. So the two billion people that don't have electricity, they have a perspective. The one billion people that don't have clean drinking water, they have perspectives. We're trying to get them like us. Because I have the truth. This is the way we live. And that becomes the dominant thought. And it becomes the norm. This is the normal way to do things. This is how everybody does it, isn't it? And if they're not, they're doing it wrong. And so, as one of my teachers said, when, you're, when things are going good for you, it's still normal. She said, things are ducky. Things are great. And so, the world looks like a duck to those of us that live in the dominant culture. People outside the dominant culture, they know the world looks like a duck to us. But they also know we've been tricked because they have to experience the consequences of our daily actions. They know we've been tricked like a rabbit trick. And if we really wanted to go down the rabbit hole a little further, we would listen to them and take a good look at what we're doing, maybe step outside and go, okay, what is everybody else doing? And we might see that the world, if we look really close, is actually a rabbit. And once you see the world's actually a rabbit, well, you can do two things. You can ignore it and continue doing what you're doing. Or you can lay in bed at night like TED Talk. Um, <laughs> some people change paths, some people don't. And so, I have some privilege, I feel a title, which distorts my perspective, turning it into truth, because the dominant thought becomes the norm. And then, what generally happens is I just continue to objectify the world. They're no longer trees to me, it's lumber. It's no longer land. It's a potential development. And on and on and on. It's no longer, well, these, it's, it's, these people should be happy they have a job. Not that we're exploiting them. And so I tend to objectify the world. And then what I do at the same time is I start to put things in little compartments. I don't realize the relationships between anything anymore. So I put, I compartmentalize the world. And I don't see the relationship between how we treated people in the past, our history, relates to how we treat people today, or how we treat women, or how we treat people outside of our culture, or how we might treat our food, because that's what we call it now, 
or how we treat things that we don't even consider to have life in general. So business as usual goes on, still create, we wonder why things are going wrong, and we create a mess. And so I'm born into the United States, I got a little privilege, in my case a lot. I feel entitled to it. it, distorts my perspective, turning it into truth. It becomes a dominant thought, it becomes normal to live this way. So I continue to objectify and compartmentalize the world. Therefore, I'm, I feel supreme. I have given myself purpose. My purpose is to use the things in the world. After all, my religions, my sciences, my philosophies, my art, my music all tell me that the world's for me. The problem is I created all those things, so I'm actually telling myself that I have purpose. I mean, other things have purpose, too. I call them things, of course. They're to serve me. And so, I become a supremacist. I feel supreme. I have a higher purpose. I have, I have separated. I am now above the rest. The rest is for me. And what that ultimately leads to <coughs> is violence and destruction. And not the violence and destruction like bombs and wars. The violence and destruction from I wake up and I turn on the light and I have breakfast from food from the store. And then I get in my car and I drive to work and I use a computer and then I go to lunch at some fast food restaurant and then I come back to work and work some more and then I drive home and then I watch some television and then I make a microwave meal and then I watch some more TV and then I play on the internet and then I go to bed and I hit the light switch day after day after day after day and people all over the world doing this. Not all people, just people in the industrial culture. And so if we put it all together, Geography influences social groups that are formed, and some of these groups come with privilege. Privilege leads to the feeling of entitlement, distorts our perspectives, turning them into truth. This creates the norm, and once dominance takes hold, we continue to objectify and compartmentalize the world. It becomes easy. This ease is known as supremacy, because we have given ourselves purpose. And that ultimately leads to the violent destruction of the living planet. And then you're like, what do you want me to do? I'm stuck. I mean, I just can't go live in the woods. I don't have the skill set to do that, even if I wanted to. And so what do we do? We fight for justice. We fight for justice in a system that needs injustice to survive. This system needs oppression and it needs privilege on a daily basis. It needs things on the bottom so it needs things on the top to survive. And so we, we do patchwork. We try and make the prison, so to speak, more comfortable. But we never actually think, well, maybe I should get out of the prison. But that's crazy. Like, what's outside of the prison? I don't know. What are we going to do? And so we all hope for better things. We hope this politician will save us. We hope this particular law will improve things. We hope this online petition that we sign comes through this time. But we're going to continue going on with our careers because i got shit to do. And so I call it the hope and awareness mode. We're certainly aware. I mean, we attend tech talks and we see a lot of documentaries and we read a lot of books. But we never actually can take that step towards the exit of our culture. And I don't know what your step is. My step is quitting my job and going to, to homesteads to work for food and shelter so I can learn how to get my food, water, and shelter. That's it. That seems frightening to a lot of people. I get it. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that should be your step, but if you think this is destructive, you should start thinking about your own step. So a lot of people have compared what my wife and I are doing to migrant workers, which is an insult to migrant workers. Because first of all, um, I had a career to give up and I had a credit score to trash. I have privilege. People that are migrant workers, they don't get invited into homesteads for an educational opportunity. And they certainly have a skill level and work ethic that I can't even fathom. 
I have inherent privilege. They're oppressed. I have made the decision to chase a different carrot. If you choose to leave this culture in some sort of fashion, I'm asking you tonight to start thinking about what would your step be. Because once you get out the door, and I've been out that peaked, there's a whole world out there waiting. And they will welcome you. But you have to listen. Thank you.